you're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up, and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the Audacious Leadership Podcast. We're so excited that you chose to listen, to tune in, to watch, to create some space for God to speak to you. I just realized, do we ever introduce ourselves on this podcast? Maybe we should introduce each other. Ladies and gentlemen, is this good? Yeah. Uh, Your senior pastor, Sophia Barrett. Greetings. So good to be with you wherever you are. Okay, hit me. And this is Pastor Paul Reed, the one and only. Oh, there you go. I knew there was more. The one and only. <laughs> the incomparable. Oh, wow. Pastor Paul Reed. Yes, and it is our joy to speak to you. We're in the middle of a series of podcasts, actually, three episodes. This is number three on the bounce on the same subject, and we're talking about waking up the spiritual giant that is in you. Remember, you are a spiritual leader. You're not just a volunteer for a good cause or even a, um, you know, kind of like a key player in in some kind of... um, Or a cog in a big machine. Yes, exactly. But you are a spiritual leader. And uh, even if the responsibility that you might carry is um, doesn't feel that spiritual. Yeah. Maybe, maybe your role is a bit more about activation, getting things going, uh, you know, the administration, the operation and all of that. Because this is the church, this is the house of God, you are a spiritual leader. Absolutely. And so therefore, we are required... Much loved and needed. Yes, we. we you are required to grow spiritually um, because you're a spiritual leader. And so we've really been sort of highlighting the fact that it's easy to fall asleep spiritually. And these podcasts are like the sound of an alarm clock that is saying it's time to wake up. That's right. And to stir up the gift of God that's within us. Um, We often talk about the Holy Spirit in our lives being like a flame. And we know that flames unattended die out. And so what we need to do is to stir it up, to fuel the fire yep. to find those disciplines that actually breed strength and focus and longevity because we want you for the long haul. And uh, that's what we've been talking about and we're really excited about this one. Yeah, absolutely. So you're not just a passenger on the leadership bus, but you're actually uh, in the driving seat of your own um, of your own leadership and it's, it's down to you. In part, not exclusively, but you have a part to play is what we're saying in growing as a spiritual leader. You are a spiritual giant and we're trying to wake that up in you. We've had eight disciplines so far across the previous episodes, four in each one, and we've got four for you today. And these specifically, are, um, unlike the others, these are almost like corporate ones, disciplines that you're not doing by yourself, but actually there's a a requirement of these disciplines that we come together. And that's Brilliant. why it's awesome that you're part of a community of faith. You're part of a small group. You're part of a family. You're part of, you know, something bigger than just yourself. And we need to thank God for that because um, it's there's nothing like it. It's breathtaking what we can do together in comparison to being by ourselves. I love the fact that the Lord saves us one by one, but he puts us into a family. He puts us into a spiritual community. And that's not just for, you know, the sake of getting together, but it actually is part of our connection. It's a part of our um, life giving. We get life from the Lord, but we also get life and healing from each other. And that's why we're, we're so passionate about when we gather together as a church or we're so passionate about our small groups or our leadership life groups because we know that each and every one of the people in our world are a gift from God to us. They give us strength. They give us comfort. They give us love and affirmation and um, confirm the word of God in our lives. And it is essential. We cannot do this life alone. We've got to have each other. Absolutely. And the church is a family, but also I would say you can see leadership like a family, less less a hierarchy, but more of a family. You know, there's times when when it's my 
my time to shine or whatever, or it's my moment to to lead the charge. But then, you know, in a different scenario, the kind of the sphere moves round, and who was at the bottom now comes up to the top, and then it moves this way and that way, and we're all connected. Um, and so we're all growing together, learning together, and it's absolutely awesome. So we've got four spiritual disciplines, four, uh, four uh, exercises in the gym um, to, uh, to keep moving in this direction. Number one, today's episode, spiritual discipline number one is confession. Confession. That sounds very old fashioned. Yeah, well, also negative. Some of these disciplines, we've had to like say the word and then go, okay, get what's in your mind out of your mind because it isn't like solitude or, you know, it's more uh, having a different perspective on it. Confession, I guess, has a. Because all these things are awesome. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely awesome. So, confession um, is the sharing, it's the sharing of of pretty much what's going on the inside with somebody that you trust yep. and is trustworthy. Yeah. I mean, when we think confession, we think, uh, you know, the court of law or like, you know, the movies where it's like, do you confess? And if you do confess, what follows that is a charge. It's like or, negative, a consequence. You're going to jail, you're paying a fine. Yes. Confession equals negative consequence. Or confession equals hu- uh, humiliation. Yeah. This is going to be humiliating. I'm going to be mortified. It's going to be terrible. Um, but actually, the Lord has, has given this to us because it breeds life. Yeah. The Bible says two things about confession that are both significant, and they both dispel the myth that confession is purely negative. Okay. Number one in uh, 1 John, it says this, 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, this is like to God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. So there's not a negative connotation. When you go to God and go, this is how I feel. This is what I've done. This is what's going on in my life. God's not there with, you know, a stick ready to beat. The Bible says he's there ready to forgive and purify, which is awesome. But I suppose what we're talking about in this corporate setting is a different verse, which is in James chapter 5. Well, let me just pause on that one because before you go on, think about that. Think about that. If we confess our sins to the Lord, who is all knowledgeable, all like he knows everything. So he knows what we've done, but yet the Bible says there is power when we articulate it, when we actually tell God our sins and then forgiveness can flow. Now, yeah. Awesome. Well, let's go to the next. Yeah. So James 5, 16 says this, therefore con- confess your sins to each other. Uh Oh, this is like next level stuff because although there might be some resistance in confessing to God, it's like, I don't know, no one else can hear that. <laughs> but when you confess That's private, in, yeah, in James, it says confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. This Brilliant. is like next level. So God is the only one that can forgive you. I can't forgive you I, for, for your sin, I mean. Um, so, so I shouldn't try. Um, so God can can forgive, but healing comes through this process of actually confessing to each other. So I guess what we're talking about in this discipline is, um, I, I suppose, firstly, I was going to say having people around your life that you can be honest with, vulnerable with. But the reality is most of us do have the people like we have people around our lives. We just perhaps the challenge is taking those relationships to the next level. I don't know. Sometimes I think that we look around the people of our lives and say, can I really trust them? Okay. Like, will they hold this against me? Yep. If I share what, what I've done or if I share what I'm going through or whatever it is that we, we know we need to confess. Um, but I think that relationships grow and if you, you can test it out. You can test out your relationships. You can say, okay, I really trust this person, but we've never gone to this level of conversation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a little bit yep. and see how it goes. And then you can, you know, with time, start to share a little bit more and then a little bit more because that trust is being built up through experience. But uh, I think the scripture is so clear that if we don't confess to each other, then 
we don't get healed. And if we don't get healed, that means that we're sick. Something's wrong on the inside. We know that sin hurts us, but sin that we don't confess can actually lay the effect of it. Can even if we don't do it anymore, even if we've managed to overcome and got, you know, breakthrough in that area, the very fact that we're carrying it with us and that nobody else knows about it can actually do us harm and can create and allow wounds to to stay in our soul. And so it's so important that we don't live sick on the inside or we don't live with those open wounds or that shame. Oh, gosh, that's it. What those things do if they're not confessed is that shame can actually grip your heart and, um, and literally kill you so slowly over time. But the minute you share it with somebody else, do you ever get that feeling when you've ever had that conversation, you've been brave enough to have that conversation and you're like, oh, I feel so good. Yeah, I feel so much better. Oh, like a weight lifted off. Yeah. This is, what, this is what this discipline does. It takes that weight, that wound out. It, it almost brings it into the light and now it has no hold on you anymore. Shame can't have a hold on you anymore. This, is, this reminds me of the, um, the parable of the sower where it says that some of the seed fell uh, amongst um, the thorny ground and although it started to grow, the weeds or the thorns grew up and choked the word, it says. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we can, you know, the seed of the word of God, which has been one of our, featured in many of our other disciplines, um, doesn't grow in term doesn't produce the harvest that we were promised but it's because this um this stuff that we keep in the dark um it chokes the word and by simply um getting people around you being honest being vulnerable sharing lives what we're doing is is we're we're turning over the soil we're making good soil so that when we are practicing our other disciplines like studying the word we can see a harvest of 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 fruit in our lives from that word these disciplines all go together that's why you got to you got to practice them all exactly and what could that look like practically it might be that you've had some breakthrough in your life you know god's come and he's helped you overcome addiction or he's helped you overcome you know um the uh, you know feeling the the weight of shame over um things from the past or you know recent past but you still feel like you can't move forward or you still feel like something's holding you back. It could be this, that you've kept all of that private, but as you share it, as you articulate it with somebody who's trustworthy, that that could be the key to actually feeling a release to move forward. Awesome. So there you go. There's the first discipline for today's episode. Let's move on to number two. I mean, we could talk all day about all day. each one of these. Uh, number one, confession. Number two is simply worship. Corporate worship in, in the sense, because we know we all can worship privately, but this is about- Worship is a lifestyle and all that jazz. That's right. But what we're talking about is the gathering of God's people and worshiping as a body. That, that is powerful. When everybody adds their faith together, when everybody links hands metaphorically together, yeah. says we're here in one place to support one another and to lift up a sound to God. There's nothing like it. Absolutely. And I guess the, the, the enemy, without being too spooky, um, knows the power of this. And so we'll do whatever it takes to keep you out of the presence of God. Of course, when we say presence of God, we know that we're always in God's presence. But when we come together, there's there's like almost like a heightened awareness maybe of the presence of God and a focus. There's an accountability. Like if we're all together in worship and, and someone is, you know, lay on the ground playing on their phone, you know, that's unlikely to happen because that person would be like, oh, we're, we're worshiping. The reason, you know what I'm saying? yeah, exactly. The reason why we call it a discipline is because there are so many things that can pull you away, yep. like your feelings, you know, and just saying, you know what, I've messed up this week, or you know what, I'm tired, or you know what, I don't like this song. I don't like this song. Um, I'm not feeling it. And I've heard a lot of people talk about authenticity. I'm just, I'm just being honest. I'm just, I feel like a hypocrite if I worship God, but I actually feel resentful or I feel angry or I feel 
you know, down, whatever it is, you know, I'm just trying to be authentic. I'm mm. going to worship like one day a year if that's the, <laughs> if that's the measure because there's always something going on, right? Absolutely. But we know that these are disciplines that we do by faith, yeah, not by feelings. So as an audacious leader, we encourage you to take your worship, corporate worship, to another level. Absolutely. Make sure that you do not allow those excuses to keep you back and to, um, you know, rob you of the the power that is available when we worship together. That makes that means making Sundays um, part of the rhythm of your life um, and never never missing out a the window. I say to myself as an audacious leader, every time I'm in corporate worship, this is my window. I'm never going to get this window again yep. to shift the spiritual atmosphere, to create an atmosphere of faith, to um, be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is my window. I need to give it everything that I've got. That's why we have certain things in place in, in audacious to like help with this stuff. So for example, we're always singing new songs. Like you could be like, oh, not another new one, that kind of thing. But reality is we all know we can sing things without thinking when we know them. But when it's a new song, you've got to squint. You're like one line behind the worship leader. You're like, <laughs> until you get to the chorus. And then you're like, oh, yes, I know this bit. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's why we do new songs. Because we're trying to keep people, trying to help people engage and do just this. This is my moment to worship. Also, the reason why it's so demonstrative and physically like involved is because, you know, of course you can lay down in the presence of God and you can wander the meadows, but corporate worship is about, like, engagement. It's about coming together and, you know, we kind of jump up and down because it's the easiest dance move we know. Uh, there's nothing holy about it as such, but what is great is the level of engagement that that re is required to do that. So that means... No hands in pockets in corporate worship. Come on, leaders, take them out. That's it. I mean, what what are we here for? Is he the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Is he not worthy of everything that we've got? And it, we can also say um, no golf claps from audacious leaders. Yep. If he's worthy of a hand clap, if he's worthy of our best, then let's clap like, you know, our hands are going to fall off. And um, that means putting your heart and soul and body into the moment when we gather together because we need each other. You know, I was thinking just one last thing before we move on to the third um, discipline for this episode is that as a leader, it's actually quite easy to uh, be distracted by our role. So whatever role we might play as a right. leader yeah. when it's worship time or dare I even say hide behind our role. There's always something to do. As always, you know, yeah. as leaders, you know, when it's worship time, oh, this is a good opportunity to just go out of the room and check this. Or I'll just get my phone out and just text and make sure X is sorted. But guys, we've got to understand that's why this is a discipline. As we recognize we do what it takes before so that during the phone is off, the hands are out of the pockets, the mind is engaged, the body is engaged. We're actually worshiping God together would join in our faith. Absolutely. Yeah. That is, that is real. That's real. We can always look busy and look like we're doing something. Yep. Um, but we're really, we're just saying, you know, well, I'm tired. I don't really want to, I really don't want to bring I'm my worship right this, now. I'm cleaning this toasting machine because it has to be done right <laughs> now. Not so much. Sorry if you're the toasty monitor, but there you go. That's All awesome. right. So confession, worship, number three, third discipline. Is guidance. And we've got some scriptures. Um, for this discipline, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1 says, Listen, my sons, to the Father's instruction. Pay attention and gain wisdom. Yep. Um, then it says in verse 5, it says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. And then we jump to verse, verse seven. 7, and it says, The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. So this idea of guidance is talking about um, almost like this. I, I love it when you talk about this, this idea of a sage. Do you want to just explain? A wise one. Yeah. Do you want to just explain like what that means or what that is or what it looks like? It's having people in your world that are wise, that perhaps have um, unique experience. They have um, longevity 
in the word. They have longevity in life. They've got longevity in what it means to serve the Lord, to pursue him passionately. And these are people in your world that can give you great perspective. As audacious leaders, we know that we're going through the ebbs and flows of life. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's tough. Um, Sometimes um, we love it. Sometimes we think, this is rubbish. And these are the people in our world that we run to and go, please, just help me understand what I'm going through or help me to know what to do in this situation. I know that um, one of those people in my world is my mum. She has incredible wisdom when it comes to the things of um, my soul, um, things of life. Just She's just incredible that way. But I'll tell you a, a real uh, relationship that I had for a little time was Glenn's dad. He was my theology lecturer at um, Bible college. And uh, over, over the time that we were at college together, he became a really important relationship in my life. And I remember multiple times where I didn't understand something, where I thought this is frustrating, when I thought this is horrible and I don't like it and I don't want to be here. How many times I would go into his office and just, you know, blab. <laughs> and he would just be calm and he would give me a really healthy godly perspective on my circumstances or my feelings and it just made me feel okay the world isn't falling down around me the sky isn't falling down um i I'm, I'm okay i can i can do this and that is our prayer but it's also our challenge to you as audacious leaders that those people are out there and that as a leader, it's really your responsibility to find them. Yeah, it's easy for us to rely on the structure, I think, you know, to provide that for us. But I reckon that's probably base level, you know, leadership is to just kind of look up up the line, up the chain of command, if you like, and go, okay, there's my person. But um, the reality is, especially in, in a church like ours, a growing church like ours, there is like a real depth and a richness to the to the just the, the types of people that are in the church. Um and when you think about your life and leadership, you know, there'd be different people that you could you, you could go to. I've been married for twenty years. Um and that is the extent of my knowledge and experience about marriage. Now if someone around me has been married for one year, then you know, I might be able to you know, give some insight or kind of like say, I know that that's what it feels like. But, you know, looking back, I, I thought that, but I think this. So what I need to do is find someone, you know, that's maybe been married for 40 years. And um, I have, there's a couple that I meet or the guy of the couple that I meet probably every couple of months and they've been married for 50 years. And so I'm able to say, you know, he's not a he's not a preacher. He's not a leader, as in the badge. He doesn't have the office of leader, but he's definitely a sage in my life. And I talked to him about marriage. I talked to him about um, he he owns quite a few houses. So like talked to him about things like that. And uh, and my that spiritual discipline of finding that person who really has little to no consequences, whatever I say to him, he's not listening through the filter of, oh, what does this mean for me? What, what, what about, you know, the consequences of you saying that he just literally, you know, we'll go out, we'll have something to eat. And he's, he's just purely there for me, which is a massive privilege. So even though we're saying discipline, we're saying this is awesome. That's really important that you can find that person that you can talk unfiltered to. You don't have to think, oh, what are they going to think of me? You know, they're going to judge me. You need that person who's just going to, they're not unshockable. They'll just yeah. listen to whatever you say. It's not going to shake their faith in the Lord. It's not going to, you know, make them run around the, the room in horror. <laughs> it's, they're just going to be able to just give you really sound wisdom. I, I think it's, it bears uh, stating that they don't have to have gray hair. And they don't have to be necessarily wise in every area of life. True. Because sometimes those people are just not around. But maybe you can find somebody who is uh, wise in finance and you speak to them about your finances. Godly yep. people who have, you know, honored the Lord 
in their finance and that's their strength. And then you can find somebody else to talk about yeah. maybe marriage or relationships. And then you can find somebody else to get wisdom on about health and, you know, how to, how to live a healthy life. So you can really compartmentalize this role. Um, and, and it's got nothing to do with age. It's got all to do with godly wisdom. Yep. And your intention, your proactiveness as a leader to say, I'm going to go after this stuff because where I'm at is not where I was, but I want to move forward. And can I just add to that? Be teachable. Audacious leaders, be teachable. I've had many a people come up to me, ask me for my advice. And then be offended. And then go, oh, that's great. And then go and do whatever they want. <laughs> I'm thinking, why ask me if you were just going to go and do whatever you want? These are, It says here in um, Proverbs 4 verse 1, it says, Listen, my sons, to your father's instruction and pay attention and gain wisdom. It's almost like do whatever it is that you, that you hear the instruction. And like, a, like, like I'm saying, these people are not just any people. They're people that you give permission to speak into your life yeah. and you say, you know what, I'm going to listen and act on what you say because I'm trusting this relation. I'm trusting you and, and I'm giving you permission to do it. So don't be like foolish people that go around asking for advice and never take it. Yeah. All right. So we've got confession. We've got worship. We've got guidance. And the last one is celebration. This one sounds good. We don't have to persuade people on this one, I don't think. This is like we, we're all about the parties. That's right, especially audacious leaders. We love to party. But the reason why this is a discipline because it's talking about corporate celebration. In other words, coming together, creating a moment to celebrate what God is doing. Absolutely important imperative. I think probably this would be tough if you're just stuck in do mode. Get your jobs done, you know, get your routine done. But it's actually a discipline to set time aside together to celebrate what God's doing, to worship God for what He's doing, to praise Him for what He's doing, or to celebrate each other. We we're gonna we're gonna celebrate this person in our team, or we're gonna celebrate that we've been praying for this situation to shift and and it did. Or milestones. Sometimes we we get out of practice of just celebrating a win. You might have d done an event. You might have done a good job on um, a certain aspect of your strategy and planning. And then what we tend to do is just move on. Oh, that was a moment. Great. Awesome. You know, scored some goals. And we just move on to the next thing. But actually just saying, no, no we're not going to do that. We're going to take a moment and celebrate this win that we were all involved in or this win that that I set myself a goal and I achieved it. It's so important to do that. Absolutely. It's like the difference between a hole-in-one on your own. Imagine that. You take, you take a swing at the golf ball. It's an absolute sweet shot, goes through the air, lands on the green, rolls in, and then you're like... Little praise party on your own? Yay. Whereas imagine that on like championship final you can tell i'm not a golfer like there's literally like a hundred people around the green there's like loads of people watching on on tv you make the same shot same everything's the same but in that moment there's this celebration together it, it like multiplies it by you know to the nth degree yeah and so that's why in in many of the things that we do at audacious we actually Take the time and a discipline to say, okay, before we go any further, let's let's just celebrate what God is doing. That's the definition or one of the, um, not definitions, that's one of the fruit of what we call a testimony. Like this is the tale of what happened. Isn't God good? Um, that never gets boring. Absolutely. Never gets boring, but it also has a transference of blessing to a Others. And faith. It lifts faith, lifts faith. In, in, in other people. So, so what might seem frivolous, time-wasting, yeah. you know, we've got to get on, we've got a job to do, we've just got to keep going. Um, what may seem frivolous is actually strategic and life-building. 
Yeah, so here's here's your challenge as an audacious leader is uh, is saying, okay, every time we get together to plan, talk, dream, review, whatever it might be, you've got an agenda, you've got stuff to do, why don't you put at the top of the agenda, celebrate or party or testimony or faith or something that says, okay, we're going to actually be intentional about saying, isn't God doing some awesome things? Um you know, the number of people in Audacious Church this year that have said yes to Jesus and then just celebrating about that. Or, you know, we we had these goals that we were trying to achieve and we we, we blew them out of the water. Um, it's not being big headed. It's not because essentially we're saying, look at what God is doing. Um, and so this is a discipline because it's easy to just plow on, like Sof said, um, and we need to build it into into our lives. I love the fact that testimony says it means do it again. Do it again, Lord. And this is an important part of our spiritual discipline is to take those moments, share the stories, share the successes, share the attempts even. You know what? I had a go. Didn't work. Woohoo! Let's celebrate that. So let's celebrate the fact that you tried, that yeah. you stepped out in An audacious faith. attempt. It may not have worked out the way you planned, but we celebrate that you took that step anyway. Absolutely. This is hugely important in terms of building your faith and building your spiritual world. Yeah, the Bible says in Revelation, they overcame, speaking about us, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. So this is like Jesus, the cross, but also by the word of their testimony. In other words, what that cross has done in their life. And so this is literally scriptural, what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. This is not just like, you know, hey, let's be American or let's just be super enthusiastic. No, no, we're actually doing what the Bible says. We, we, we want to overcome. And the way we do that is the combination of the power of the cross plus what the cross is doing, the fruit, the, the impact of the cross on our lives. So four disciplines for this episode, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. So these are two things. If you're feeling sluggish in your spiritual walk and you're like, something's not right, let's look at these four disciplines and see how you can work them in the next seven days or in, in the next few weeks. And also, if you're saying to yourself, you know what, I'm just, I'm loving this waking with the spiritual giant within me. I want to just go, keep going, keep going to another level. Then try out these um, spiritual disciplines. For For both scenarios, they're going to be so beneficial and awesome for you. Absolutely. Good on you for creating the space, like we said right at the top of this podcast. Um, we genuinely, this is not just like, you know, hearsay this or whatever. We genuinely uh, cannot wait to see the fruit of, of the spiritual temperature being raised in Audacious. Yeah, and, absolutely. And you, and you are, you playing a part in that. Um, and we know that the vision of the church is there's plenty of room for you in that. Um, and so let's let's wake it up. Let's do it. We'll see you next time.